Hey you guys, just a quick warning. The case I'm covering in this episode involves the death of a child. Listener discretion is advised. In the early morning hours of August 12, 2008, Christy Scott was home alone with her children. Her husband was out of town. After putting her two sons to bed, Christy finished the movie she was watching. Later, she was awakened out of a dead sleep, quickly realizing that something was wrong. Her house was on fire. Christy whisked her youngest son out of the burning house, but sadly, her six-year-old son was still inside. On the surface, it seemed that time was not on Christy's side, and she had to make a choice that no parent ever wants to make. However, as investigators dug their heels into the case, a theory arose that painted Christy as a murderer, a mother who no longer wanted her inconvenient son. This is Jamie, and you're listening to Murderish. Join me as I walk you through the case involving Mason Scott. Situated in northern Alabama is Russellville, a small town with just under 10,000 residents. A relatively quiet town, there aren't many notable moments that have taken place there. With a low crime rate, low population, and not a lot happening, it's not surprising that a house fire, which claimed the life of a young boy, would rock Russellville to its very foundation. It was just before 2.30 on the morning of August 12, 2008, when Jennifer Davidson was awakened out of a dead sleep by a loud pounding on her front door. Together with her boyfriend, Jennifer ran to the door to see what was happening. She was stunned to find her next-door neighbor, Christy Scott, standing frenzied on her porch. Christy, holding her youngest son Noah in her arms, frantically begged Jennifer to call 911 and to tell them her house was on fire. Jennifer's 911 call came in at 2.31 a.m. Within 10 minutes, the fire department and ambulances had arrived and began efforts to extinguish the fire, which had by then engulfed the house. More than five minutes would pass before Christy mentioned a detail that would radically change the actions of emergency responders. Christy approached a first responder and said that her oldest son was still in the house. After learning that Mason was still inside the burning house, first responders attempted to reach him. Due to the size and extreme temperature of the fire, firefighters were not able to enter the home. Instead, their focus switched to putting out the fire as fast as possible. They targeted their efforts on the bedroom that Christy identified as being Mason's. It would take four long hours before they were able to safely enter the house. Tragically, Mason did not survive the fire. Born to Jeremy and Christy Scott in 2003, Mason Scott was a lively six-year-old boy who had started kindergarten two weeks before the fire. Mason had a mild form of autism known as Asperger's, along with ADHD and other developmental and processing disorders. With the help of intervention at school and prescription medications, Mason was able to overcome so many obstacles and lived a fairly normal life. Everyone who knew Mason described him as sweet and fun-loving. The small-framed, strawberry-blonde boy had a bright smile, daring personality, and a wild imagination. Although Mason felt love from many people close to him, it appeared as though Christy had a hard time interacting with her son. It was apparent that something was just a little bit different about Mason, but Christy seemed to treat her son's differences as something more drastic than they actually were. Despite the obstacles Mason was overcoming with the help of teachers and others, Christy was frustrated by the behavioral issues that resulted from his ADHD and Asperger's, and by what she perceived as a lack of progress. She often complained to people about how unbearable he was. Not much is known about Christy Scott's childhood. She was born in 1978 and grew up with two nurturing parents who were paragons in the community where she was raised. It seems that her parents were lovingly involved in the lives of their grandsons, Mason and Noah. Christy and her father, Don Bray, both worked as insurance agents and had intimate knowledge of various policies and procedures, a factor that would come into play as law enforcement investigated Mason's death. After the initial shock began to wear off, 
law enforcement began suspecting Christy Scott was responsible for setting the fire and leaving her son inside the house deliberately. Oddly, this was not the first house fire Christy had experienced. In fact, in the three years prior to Mason's death, Christy had been involved in three different house fires, all of which led to insurance claims. In the days that followed the deadly house fire, investigators worked to figure out how the fire started and why Mason could not be rescued. As experts and investigators flooded the charred house, Christy went to live with her parents. Her husband, Jeremy, did not accompany his wife. Instead, he took their youngest son, Noah, to live with him at his parents' house. An autopsy triggered suspicion in Jeremy's mind and divided the couple. The autopsy found that a large amount of sedatives were found in Mason's system. This prompted Jeremy to file a protection from abuse order against Christy and to take their youngest son to live with him. Franklin County Judge Terry Dempsey issued a warrant for her arrest after realizing that Christy had taken out a life insurance policy on Mason less than 12 hours before his death. In the month following the fire, Christy Scott was arrested after she turned herself in. She was charged with murder with the intent of monetary gain, murder by intentionally committing first-degree arson, and murdering a person under 14 years of age. After being denied bond, Christy awaited trial in Franklin County, Alabama. Don Bray, Christy's dad, had a connection with a local defense attorney named Robert Tutin. Bray sought out Tutin because he specialized in defending clients in capital murder cases. Tutin agreed to represent Christy, and he quickly got to work building a defense for her. Right away, Tutin asked a judge to grant bond to Christy, claiming that she wasn't a flight risk because her parents, son, and husband, with whom she had recently reconciled, all lived in the area. The judge was not swayed, and Christy continued to wait for her trial behind bars. Tutin also petitioned the court for a change of venue, arguing that there would not be a single person in the small town who hadn't heard of the fire and already deemed Christie guilty. The request was denied, but the judge did allow for the jury pool to be increased from 200 to 500 people, making the jury selection process span over a five-day period. Although Christie's family was able to afford the best defense lawyer the area had to offer, Tutin knew from the beginning that he had his work cut out for him. Without many other legal maneuvers available, Christie's case headed to trial. In June of 2009, almost a year after Mason's death, Christie's trial began. Presiding over the trial was Judge Terry Dempsey. Franklin County District Attorney Joey Rushing led the prosecution, while Attorney Robert Tutin led the defense. After entering a plea of not guilty, the defense made their opening statements. They alleged that Christy Scott had merely been an unlucky bystander to a horrific tragedy. They argued that the fire, which began in Mason's bedroom, was due to faulty wiring and that the fire was able to smolder undetected before viciously igniting and engulfing the room in thick smoke and intense heat. The defense argued that those factors made it impossible for Christy to reach her son. The defense told the jury that Christy had to be restrained from re-entering the home for her own protection and that she was fighting to get inside to save her son. The prosecution painted a much different picture of Christy. D.A. Rushing told the jury that Christy was tired of putting up with a child who had special needs, and that she saw a way to rid herself of the problem and make money at the same time. As was the case with the other three fires Christy experienced, Rushing alleged that the defendant orchestrated the fire in her son's bedroom, ensuring that he would not survive and that she would make upwards of $175,000 upon his death. Dr. Emily Ward from the Alabama Department of Forensic Scientists was called to testify. Although this testimony was gut-wrenching, there was some consolation. Dr. Ward testified that it seemed Mason died of smoke inhalation without ever waking up. In a rare move, Christy Scott testified in her own defense. 
she attempted to lay out the events of August 15th evening and the early morning hours of August 16th. Christie's husband Jeremy had been out of town on business, leaving her home alone with her two sons. Christie testified that her oldest son Mason had been sick that week, so she gave him his prescription cough medicine and then put him and Noah to sleep in the bedroom they shared. Christie said she then watched TV. She told the jury that around 11 p.m., she went in to check on her boys before going to sleep. She saw that Noah, her four-year-old, was still awake, so she picked him up to go to sleep in her bed for the night. At around 2.30 in the morning, Christy recalled that she was awoken when Noah hit her in the face with his hand. She said that's when she smelled smoke. She told the jury that she rushed into the hallway to get Mason, but the smoke and heat were too intense. Realizing that she needed to get Noah out of the house quick, Christy said she went back to her bedroom and jumped out of the window with Noah in tow. She said she raced over to her next-door neighbor's house and banged on the door until her neighbor Jennifer answered. Christy said she yelled at Jennifer to call 911 and that she shoved Noah into the house so she could go back and get Mason. As Christy recalled, it was at this point that she raced back to the house and tried to open the garage because the rest of the doors were locked. She told the jury that she could see fire coming out of her son's bedroom window and traveling up to the roof of her house. Unable to open the garage door, Christy testified that she then ran to the front door and attempted to break in, but she was stopped by Brian Copeland, her neighbor Jennifer's boyfriend. On the stand, Christy emphasized that she loved Mason and was doing everything she could to rescue him that morning, but she was restrained until the fire department showed up at which point she stopped. Jennifer Davidson, Christie's neighbor, was called to testify. Jennifer remembered that she heard an incredibly loud banging on her front door around 2.30 in the morning on August 16th. She raced down to the front door, trailed by her boyfriend, Brian. When she saw that it was Christy, she opened the door to find Christy yelling at her to call 911. Jennifer testified that Christy left Noah with her and then started running back to her own house. Jennifer said that after she called 911, she sat with Christy as firemen worked to extinguish the flames and save Mason. Jennifer told the jury that Christy was crying out, Don't call Jeremy. He'll kill me or hurt himself. Jennifer also testified about Christy's odd behavior on the night of the fire and the days directly after. She told the jury that during the fire, she overheard Christy asking around to find out which fire marshal would be coming to her house. Jennifer said there was one specific fire marshal that Christy did not want at the scene. Jennifer also said she later realized that while Christy was sitting in the ambulance, fully dressed in daytime clothing, she pulled her cell phone out of her pants pocket and in a surprised voice mentioned that she had her phone the entire time and that she could have called 911. Brian Copeland, Jennifer's boyfriend, also testified. He confirmed parts of Jennifer's story, but disagreed with some of it, and he remembered the night quite differently from Christy. Though Christy claimed that she tried to open the garage door and the front door to her home, Brian recalled that he was actually the one who went around the house and tried to open various doors. In fact, Brian testified that Christy seemed to discourage his efforts, telling him that it was no use and that the doors were all locked. Brian told the jury that he never saw Christy anywhere near the garage keypad, much less frantically trying to enter the code. Finally, Brian wholly denied ever having to restrain Christy from going back into the house. He claimed that Christy never made an attempt to run back into the burning house. One of the first responders on the scene, Jerry Yarborough, also noted Christy's odd behavior and seemingly inappropriate comments. Yarborough watched as Christy Scott's father, Donald Bray, arrived at the scene and started yelling that Christy had murdered his grandbaby. Seemingly upset by this, Christy began crying in the ambulance in front of Yarborough, who tried to calm her down. Christy responded by yelling that he didn't understand and that she had killed her husband's baby. Yarborough told the jury that Christy told him she didn't want a specific fire marshal from Colbert County to come to her house because she didn't like him. 
Finally, Yarborough testified that Christie made another odd comment about how she could be so unlucky as to have two house fires in the preceding three years. Elsie Malone, an emergency medical technician, testified that once she cleared Christie and told her she didn't need to go to the hospital, Christie flatly told her that she wasn't sure how to tell her husband that she let their son die. The odd behavior did not end there. Anna K. Greenhill was a hairstylist at Hello Gorgeous Salon. Oddly, Jeremy and Christy came to see her to cut Jeremy's hair only hours after their son died. Greenhill recalled that during the entire 20-minute appointment, Christy and Jeremy were joking and bantering and never mentioned anything about Mason or the fire. Another witness, Heather McAlpin, testified that she overheard a stomach-turning comment Christy made to Jeremy at Mason's funeral. Heather said that she heard Christy whisper, Noah has always wanted a baby sister. Maybe he can get one now. Another shocking discovery was presented to the jury. It had been revealed that Christy was having an emotional affair with a man named William Markham. Though both parties testified that there was nothing sexual between them, they both admitted to spending countless hours together, growing more and more emotionally involved. Markham was called to testify about the relationship he had with Mason, as well as the relationship he observed between Mason and his mother. Markham told the court that he didn't really care for the child, and in rough terms, suggested that Mason should have been spanked more often to correct his behavior. Markham explained that any harsh treatment Mason received from Christie was only a consequence of his own delinquent behavior. While Christie's actions during the fire were bizarre, her reported actions before the fire were also not normal. Russell Yon, who conducted a forensic examination of a computer that was removed from the Scott residence, testified that he found web searches on real estate websites looking at houses for sale in the area. Senior Vice President at Alpha Insurance, Robert Robinson, testified that Christie had two separate life insurance policies on both Mason and Noah, and that on August 15th, the day before the fire, Christie had applied for a third life insurance policy for Mason, not Noah. The first two life insurance policies amounted to a total of $75,000. The third policy, which was approved on the morning of August 16th, only hours after Mason's death, was for $100,000. This made the total life insurance payout for Mason Scott $175,000. Robinson told the court that the Scotts received a check from Alpha for $25,000, but because Christie had lied about Mason's medical history on her second policy application, they refused to pay the remaining amount. They did, however, have to pay out the third and largest life insurance policy in the amount of $100,000. Not only did Christy Scott receive insurance payouts for the death of her child, she also received home insurance payouts due to the damage from the fire. David Swindle with Farmers Insurance told the court that they had reached a settlement with the Scott family, agreeing to pay $188,000 for the house, $60,000 for the items inside that were destroyed, and $5,500 for living expenses. In total, this brought Christie's total insurance payout to almost $400,000. The thing is, this was not the first time Christie received a large payout due to a tragic event. In fact, on two prior occasions, Christy made a claim with an insurance company because of a house fire and collected a payout. In 2005, Christy lived in a house on Steel Frame Road. She put the house up for sale in May of 2005. However, after six months, it hadn't sold. Christy opted not to put the house back on the market. In January of 2005, a few months prior to listing the home for sale, Christy purchased a home insurance plan in the amount of $116,000. Kirk Berryman, the insurance agent with whom Christy had been working, testified that Christy eventually increased the insurance amount to $139,000, the maximum amount for which a home could be insured. She also added a ring to the policy, which was valued at $14,750. 
These additions to the policy all happened in December of 2005, right after Christie's house was taken off the real estate market. The following month, Christie called 911 to report a house fire. The small fire was quickly extinguished, and it was determined that the point of ignition was from a pizza box being left on top of a hot stovetop burner. The damage to the house was minimal, only requiring a few repairs. As a result, the insurance payout would have been nominal. Oddly enough, just two days later, Christie called 911 to report another house fire. This time, the fire was worse and the damage was severe. Because she was planning to make another insurance claim, Christie's second house fire was thoroughly investigated. Dwight Walden was called to review the scene, and what he discovered was interesting. Walden testified that it was obvious that the fire had been intentionally set. He said it was curious that Christie was the last one to be in the house before the fire ignited, and that the fire alarm had been disconnected. Despite these facts, Christie still received an insurance payout totaling over $185,000 after the second fire destroyed her home. The prosecution hoped that the jury would see a clear pattern of Christie being involved in house fires and then filing insurance claims. Finally, the prosecution called experts to the stand to speak about what caused the fire that killed Mason. According to one state expert, The first causes that were ruled out as a potential source of ignition were lightning, spontaneous combustion, rechargeable batteries, and faulty wiring. One expert, Dr. Rafael A. Franco Jr., an electrical engineer, testified that he was recruited by the state to help investigate the source of the fire to determine whether it was caused by faulty wiring or some other kind of electrical issue. According to Dr. Franco, who spent 12 consecutive hours examining Mason and Noah's bedroom, there was no way the fire could have been a result of faulty wiring or exposed wiring. Dr. Franco testified that there were five electrical outlets in the bedroom where the fire started. After checking each outlet source, Dr. Franco said he was confident that none of the outlets had damage that would indicate it was the source of the fire. In fact, Dr. Franco told the court that only one outlet had any noticeable damage, and even that one was hardly impaired. Next, the prosecution called James Munger to testify. Munger, who works as a fire protection consultant, offered testimony that likely made the court listen in a little closer. Munger told the jury that, in his professional opinion, the only way this fire could have started is if someone said it intentionally. Dolan Gassett, who entered the Scott house as soon as the fire was extinguished and deemed it safe for others to enter, testified on one specific piece of evidence that would prove crucial in the case against Christy Scott. The smoke alarm that was located directly outside of Mason and Noah's bedroom was found in the aftermath of the fire. Gassett testified that not only was the smoke detector unburned, it had also been manually disabled and removed from the wall. It was found on the floor, undamaged. The smoke detector was sent for testing and it was found to be fully functional and able to sound an alarm in the presence of smoke. Another fact regarding how Christie was dressed at the time of the fire was brought to the jury's attention. Christie was seen fully dressed in jeans, shoes, appropriate undergarments, and outerwear when she fled her house to escape the fire. According to Christie, she discovered the fire in the early morning hours, so it seemed odd that she would be fully dressed when she ran out of the house. It was also stated during trial that Christy had asked a family friend if she could store some things at their house a few days before the fire. It was later discovered that Christy had stored jewelry, cash, and other valuables that could have been damaged in the fire. The defense called numerous witnesses, hoping to establish that the fire was accidental and that Christy did everything she could to save her child. While the prosecution called numerous experts to testify, the defense mainly relied on character witnesses to establish Christie as a caring mother who would never even dream of harming her children. 
a fire investigation expert testified for the defense. He claimed that the fire began in a wooden TV cabinet after the wires that connected the TV and DVD player to the electrical outlet overheated and ignited the wood. The expert also testified that the state's experts had used outdated arson determination methods which inaccurately framed Christie for intentionally setting the fire. After the trial concluded, state prosecutor Joey Rushing admitted to WHNT Channel 19 News that the case they had presented heavily relied on circumstantial evidence, but that he believed it was the strongest circumstantial evidence he had ever seen in a case before. Though he was confident in his belief that Christie murdered her oldest child in cold blood, he admitted that he could only hope the jury would agree with him based on the evidence he presented. The lengthy trial spanned 15 days over a four-week period. It was the longest trial in Franklin County history. The jury were released to deliberate, and it wouldn't be long before they returned. Judge Dempsey asked the jury members if they had reached a decision regarding the three charges Christie faced. The jury answered in the affirmative and then handed their verdict over to the judge, who read it aloud to the court. Christie Scott was found guilty on all three counts. According to WHNT 19 News, Christie stood emotionless as the verdict was read, and then she was led back to her cell. Christie became the first woman in Franklin County history to be found guilty of capital murder. As the news of her conviction made the rounds, prosecutor Joey Rushing was asked if he was excited about the win in court. Rushing responded that while he couldn't celebrate the loss of life, he rested in knowing that Mason's death had not been in vain and that justice for him had been served. Rushing says he can't celebrate, but he can feel comfort in knowing that Mason's death will not be in vain. You feel vindication for the, for the victim, and you feel like justice has been served for them, but you also, it's a feeling that, you know, that you realize now that, you know, somebody's being held responsible for a death, and they may, you know, serve the rest of their life in prison or, or even be sentenced to death. For murdering her son for the purpose of monetary gain, murdering her son by way of arson, and murdering someone less than 14 years old, the jury recommended by a vote of 7 to 5 that Christie be given life in prison without the possibility of parole. Joey Rushing petitioned the judge to enact an Old Testament-style punishment, an eye for an eye, and sentenced Christie to death by lethal injection. On August 5, 2009, Judge Dempsey ignored the jury's recommendation and sentenced Christy Scott to death. Rushing commented that what Christy did was the most heinous crime Franklin County had ever seen and that he could think of nothing worse than a mother murdering her own son for an insurance payout. Today, Christy Scott resides in a six-foot by nine-foot cell in Tutwiler Prison, awaiting lethal injection. She is allowed one hour each day of isolated but guarded time outside of her cell. After the trial, Jeremy Scott was treated kindly by the press, though some wondered what role, if any, he may have played in his son's death. While some level of doubt still remains, Jeremy is currently a free man and is taking care of his surviving son, Noah. Father and son lived with Jeremy's parents for a while, but after Christie's trial ended, he moved out. In March of 2011, two years after Christie had been sentenced to death, Jeremy was ready to legally end their marriage. In 2011, Christie made headlines again when an alleged affair between her and a night shift guard named Matthew Hall came to the surface. Hall was 31 years old and working at Tutwiler, the prison where Christie resided. He worked nights, which meant he had a lot of time to kill while the inmates slept. Apparently, during this time, Christy became a confidant and Hall opened up about how unhappy he was in his marriage. The pair began talking during Hall's nighttime shifts and they built a strong connection. In March of 2011, Hall was given something to deliver to Christy, divorce papers from Jeremy Scott. Hall opened Christy's cell walked in and handed her the divorce documents and watched as she broke down into tears. According to Christy, Hall consoled her, which led to the pair kissing for the first time. 
Both parties claimed that they never had intercourse, but admitted they were physically affectionate with one another whenever they could get away from peering eyes and security cameras. The alleged affair went on for so long that Hall began talking about their future. He believed that Christie could win an appeal and that when she was released, he would buy a house and they could live in it together. While their alleged affair continued, Another inmate became aware of the relationship, and she immediately sent word to the warden regarding what was going on after hours. After an intense confrontation, Christy confessed to the relationship, and initially, Matthew Hall did too. Their confessions were recorded, and Hall was charged with a misdemeanor. At his trial in June of 2014, more than three years after the start of the affair, Hall recanted his confession and claimed that it was coerced. All of this happened as his wife stood confidently by his side. Prior to Hall's trial, the warden who had received word of the affair from another inmate retired. Due to this, and the jury not trusting Christy Scott's testimony, Matthew Hall was found not guilty. With the affair behind her, Christy Scott sat in prison awaiting her final punishment. Because she had been sentenced to death, an automatic appeal was triggered. It was filed soon after Christie's sentencing, but a decision wasn't made until October of 2012. Christie's legal team argued that many aspects of her trial were incorrectly handled and unconstitutional, which erroneously led to a guilty verdict. The town where the trial took place, the jury who had decided her fate, and even some of the permitted testimony were all attacked in an effort to get Christie's conviction overturned. One of the largest errors Christie's defense claimed was the court allowing information about Christie's previous involvement in fires and insurance claims. Her defense claimed that the insurance companies had done their own investigation, came to their own decision and payout, and that there was nothing which should have connected those occurrences to the fire that claimed Mason's life. After reviewing Christie's appeal, the court upheld both the verdict and the sentence. Throughout all of this, the trials, the scandal, and more, the community refused to forget the legacy of Mason Scott. Countless memorials, vigils, and services were held in Mason's honor, commemorating the bright young boy and honoring other children who have been harmed by their parents because they were different. Numerous charities that support families with autistic children have created ongoing virtual memorials for Mason Scott in an effort to remember the imaginative and fun-loving boy who died far too soon. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Murderish. Don't forget to follow my new podcast, Judgy and Juryish. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out Murderish.com if you want to buy Murderish t-shirts, face masks, coffee mugs, and more. If you want more Murderish content, go to Murderish.com and click the link to go behind the scenes and become a Patreon subscriber. Patreon subscribers get immediate access to bonus content as well as other perks. Also, follow me on Instagram at Murderish Podcast. I'm very active there. You can also find me on Twitter at Murderish Pod or on Facebook by searching Murderish Podcast. If you like the show and have 60 seconds of free time, do me the biggest favor and give Murderish a five-star rating and review in your favorite podcast app. Positive ratings and reviews help new listeners find the show, and I also love hearing from you guys. Murderish is mixed and mastered by John and Jessica Buchanis of Audio Editing Solutions. Music is by Nico of We Talk of Dreams. This episode was researched and written by Lincoln Edgeman. Stick around after the closing music to hear a list of sources used for this episode. As always, Ishers, thank you for joining me on another episode of Murderish. And remember... Listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish. Sources for this episode include a June 3, 2021 article at My Crime Library, a 2018 post at deadlywomen.fandom.com, an October 5, 2012 post at findlaw.com, information dated September 2, 2018, found at AminoApps.com, a Shalonda Speaks blog post dated January 1st, 1970 at shoalscrime.blogspot.com.